Mariah everything. Miss Mariah Carey, MC, Mimi. You already know everything is just so fabulous and festive. This is all for you. You oh see this, right? God. I can't even know what to say. This is so festive. <laughs> Only Nessa would hook this up like that. I see, of course. I see the MC blankety blank anniversary. What is this? Mm -hmm. What is this that you have there on the left? The, the, well, I see the shirt. But okay. I don't want to do it I think the lambs will know what the shirt is. Of course they will. Well, what's the blank? Is that a blanket? Yeah. So, well, this one's this one is from your concert, your sold out concert <laughs> holiday show last year in New York. Um, that's that. And then this is you. That is the classic. My classic um, yes, the cla the the first yes. one. Yeah, and I noticed you're wearing a charm bracelet. Yes, um, shirt. Justice yes. for Charmy. Yes. Oh my gosh. All the lambs totally understand what's going on right now. And we're so happy. And Mariah, thank you so much for taking the time to discuss your memoir, The Meaning of Mariah Carey. Thanks to Audible for having us to have this amazing conversation because the audio book is incredible. I mean, uh -huh. it just takes you to a different level. Congratulations on all of its success. New York Times number one best selling author. Here you are. And Audible number one best selling audiobook. So you know this, Mariah. We are always so proud of you. Your journey, um, which we finally got a glimpse of more in depth. And there's a whole different appreciation for you. I just I appreciate you before, but really hearing your journey, you know, takes us to a different place. So thank you for sharing that with us. Oh, thank you so much for experiencing it with me. And yeah. I really like when people were talking to me about, oh, we got the book, we read the book. Of course, we love them to read the actual book, like the physical sure. book. That's, you know, I'm, I'm so uh, thankful and feel so blessed to actually be able to do that and look at it and look at the pictures and right. You know what I mean? Because I put a lot of thought into that um, in terms of just representing people that were kind of trying to honor my ancestors and everybody that we talk about in the book. But the audio book, as I said to you, um, mm -hmm. was really for me the best way to experience it. Um, even reading it with, yes. I'm not trying to give people more stuff to do, but like <laughs> even reading it with the audio book for me, um, that was my best, that was the most um, immersed that I was in the process, yes. you know what I mean? Because I'm just, you know, you're reading it and you're narrating it and you're jumping in, you know, I, as I do in conversation, we're in an accent over here, we're over here in another moment, but it, you know, I just kind of like tried to let it flow emotionally. Also, I didn't have as much time as I would have liked, but I feel like that worked in my favor in some ways. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about that a little bit. The actual part of you recording the audio book. Okay. So mm -hmm. here you are. And as I am listening to it, I am definitely hearing you get emotional. I am definitely hearing you um, sounding like you're about to cry. Mm -hmm. Did you cry as you were narrating this? And I'm sure there were different moments that got very emotional for you. There were. And I, if anything, I was trying not to cry. Um, and mm. if, if I, you know, when, when singing, it, for me, closes up the throat <laughs> when you get emotional and, and that's difficult. But in mm. reading, I just tried to push through because I was like, you know what, this is the honest representation of what I'm feeling and trying to emote. So I just was like, you know what, I'm keeping it. I'm not going to do what I always do and pick it apart and, you know, go mm. back. And so I was just like, this is what it is. If I sound like I'm about to cry, it's because I am about to cry. But it's a little bit of a weird experience because, you know, you're there and, the, you know, obviously my engineer was there recording with me and I, I love what we, we don't deal with like emotional stuff. Like I'm not sitting there telling him these stories. <laughs> regularly. Right. So it was pretty deep. And, and you know, when you record music, you've shared this time and time again, it really is just you and your engineer. It's very, just a private moment. Mm -hmm. Did you ever catch your engineer crying when they were? No. Looking to <laughs> no, really? No. I mean, honestly, we're not looking at each other. Like we're, you know, separate. Yeah. And whatever, but in but in it together, you know what I mean? So I, I just mean like I felt very it was the first time of kind of like revealing these moments that were yeah. very personal before that. And it's interesting because so many people, just friends or people that I've known throughout the years are like, 
I never knew this story or I never knew you went through this or how come you didn't tell me that happened to you? Yes. You know? Yes. <laughs> yes, for sure. And, and speaking of that, I, I want to go into that really quick. You know, I think a lot of people were really uh, getting insight of your childhood and trying to just understand all the trauma that you went through. And, you know, eternally 12 always sticks out. Right. And for the lambs and us fans, you know, I just getting more insight on that. Why was that important to share? Why did you, you know, give us something that was so personal? I mean, you talked about a lot. Right. Well, I've, I've always said it's, it's funny because I've been looking at different people's sort of interpretation of my story and, you know, the mm. experiences and stuff that we talk about in the book. But um, Eternally 12 is sort of has always been like, oh, I'm festive. Oh, I'm Eternally 12. Oh, yeah, we don't acknowledge time. But really, a lot of traumatic things did happen to me at 12. And in mm. working on the book and just talking about it, um, um, with Michaela and we, we really worked very hand in hand, you know, and, and talked through a lot of things and we love her. Shout out to Michaela. Yeah. Um, you know, just, I was like, yeah, so when I was 12, this happened, then, then this happened, but it, it all was around that time. So it's very, it's just sort of an interesting thing to like that dynamic, like, yeah, I, I want to be eternally 12. We all do, but it's mm -hmm. for me, 12 was not easy. 12 wow. was really hard. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we learn about this person by the name of John who, you know, your sister introduced you to him. He was a pimp and, you know, at a, such a young age. When you now look back, what do you make of this? Well, you know, that's one of the stories that a lot of people um, said to me. How come you never told me this? You know, and yeah. what are you supposed to do? Like in the middle of a normal conversation, <laughs> casual conversation. Right. <laughs> just be like hey by the way you know there was this right. when I was 12 years old I mean like it was an intense time and I think that it's it, people will hopefully anyone that's been in a similar situation it's an abusive situation I don't know how many I mean look everybody has their own stories and their own struggles and right. things that they go through um, but that was particularly defining for me that time in my life and you know looking back on it and realizing I actually could have not come through that. I could right. have been lost, completely lost, because that person was very dangerous and the surround and the people that brought me into the situation were very dangerous. Right. Um, so without getting into all the details, because I know we want everyone to experience it and, and Please, hear it. yes. Yeah, but that was uh that yeah, that was a very uh difficult time and also really helped define me and also I think made me very um, aware of like my surroundings. So it, when I think about it as a mother, it's like, no, they will never mm. be around dangerous or scary people like that. They'll never be right. in harm's way like that. You know, that should never have happened, but <sighs> we press on. Yeah. Yeah. You always do for sure. And that is why we're here. Please. I mean, we're talking about it. And by the way, we're not doing it justice because we're not getting into all the details. I mean, it is, you give us such a picture that, you know, it takes us through an emotional roller coaster. Please download the audio book. Thanks to Audible for making this happen. Trust me when I tell you, you will fully understand Mariah Carey. And for a lot of people who may, like you had mentioned, Mariah, that have gone through something similar or felt those same feelings you have, they are not alone. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the many reasons why uh, I love you and I enjoyed this experience is knowing that, you know, we're not alone, that we are connected and you are appreciated. And I can't even imagine the recording process, right? Because you record music for a living. Mm -hmm. Was it similar for you recording the audio book and music? What was the same and what was different? Okay. So <laughs> that's really an interesting question. Uh, so it was, it was, I don't mean to say that it was last minute because it doesn't feel last minute to me at all. Um, but right. I just mean I was under, it's 11 hours of <laughs> content, which is totally, and, and I'm not trying to make people think like they got to listen to an ad to 11 hours. I'm just saying it takes that much time to get through it, to record it, to narrate it, to go back and forth. So mm -hmm. it was the same process in terms of like, I'm listening to myself. I'm kind of editing right. myself as I go. But, but then it's like, 
again, a lot of it, I just, it's easier to let it go when you're not critiquing everything. Like I do mm-hmm. sing sometimes while, you know, narrating the book. If there's a, there's a lyric, we sing it occasionally, <laughs> occasionally, right. not every time. Cause I was like, sometimes I wanted to just, um, experience reading the lyrics as well, reading my lyrics, you know what I mean? To, to the people. So it wasn't, it wasn't just singing. Cause sometimes I think when you sing the lyric, people don't necessarily understand. I'm not enunciating everything perfectly. So no, it was for me, it brought me so much closer to the stories and did, did reconnect me emotionally. Was there, was there a, a certain part that connected you emotionally the most? Yes. Um, I would say my favorite chapter, it's not my, it's a very difficult chapter, but the father and the sunset. Yeah. Um, which, and- which we are definitely going to talk about and a reminder to please download the audio book, but please tell us why that stands out to you the most. Well, it, it's about, you know, mainly about my experiences with, with my father mm-hmm. and, you know, his, his passing and then we talked about the um, his actual funeral, and I was talking about the uh, the moment when my friend Marianne, aka Tots, sings um, sang "Going Up Yonder" um, at the funeral, and it just like I was in I was a wreck, but I really worked hard to make that moment. Um, special and in in recording the audiobook i was like wait marianne's not here it's covid what are we doing i wanted her to do it and so i just ended up taking you know doing it and kind of like recording it as it's almost like its own little um you know it's 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 a it's a it's like a snippet of a song but i just recently had a conversation with somebody i'm not going to reveal um Uh that i'm very excited about that um hopefully we're going to do something special with that part of the song Oh, you know. really? Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I shouldn't be giving these things away. Okay. Let's just hope is he's... It someone, uh, is it someone that we know? Is it someone yes. I know? Is, is someone, it a guy or a girl? Can you give us a hint or anything? <gasps> okay, all right. <laughs> and I'm, you know what? I get it. It's a process. And so we will be waiting for that. I'm sure, listen, Mariah, we can't have a conversation without addressing the fact that you probably have been working on music nonstop, okay? So, yes. you know... We will, you know, whatever you can share with us, we are always so grateful and thankful for. Uh, Let's talk a little bit more about the memoir and really what made you finally want to share such intimate, personal experiences with the world? Well, I feel like, I guess I just expected people to understand me, like just on a human level, but that doesn't really happen. (laughs) That doesn't really happen. And, And especially with, the kind of background and the way that I, my childhood was, and just the other stuff that we talk about in the book, you know, starting out, all these experiences that I've never had a sort of an outlet to be able to, to detail them in this way. And if you're just sitting doing a regular interview, like if we were not talking about this right now, we'd be sitting probably talking about another project, talking about breaking down the songs, gossip, whatever it is. Yes. This was a totally different venue, and this gave me the ability to really um, feel. It was a cathartic experience. It was very freeing, um, mm-hmm. and it, it just—it's just a whole other thing. So it wasn't like, oh, I, I'm just now deciding to do this. I want people to know the story, and when I'm no longer here, it's mm-hmm. there, you know. And right. also for my kids, like they should—they should know this history for them eventually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, have you had a moment to celebrate all of its success like have you had a chance to just take it all in and just ah. you know it was really sweet everybody blew up the um new york times number one best-selling um whatever the chart and um the a cover of the book the cover of the book and it just felt so like a sigh of relief you know what i mean because yeah. you never know what people are going to think especially about the you know I think I said this to you. It's like, it's a weird, it's a weird life that I've had. It's not typical. It's not typical even for a performer. It's very, you know, there are a lot of layers. So Mm -hmm. I I feel like if people are accepting me, they're accepting that little girl that I was. And when I first started wanting to make this, to write this book, it was like, the goal was to emancipate 
that little girl who didn't feel seen or heard, who didn't feel like she had a place um, in this world or even necessarily mm -hmm. deserved to live because wow. of all the weird, you know, this is the stuff that I had gone through and my own self-esteem, lack of self-esteem. Um, but you know, it's, it's a, it, for me, it's a survivor story and that's what, that's who it's for, for everybody that needs to make, make it through. Yeah, no, for sure. And you definitely feel this as you experience your audio book and you know what, let's go ahead. If it's okay with you, Mariah, I want to play an excerpt from the audio book. Okay. And this next excerpt is going to give everyone basically a glimpse of you on the come up the grind to now become a professional singer paid like a professional singer and finally seeing you living in the city talking about new york city mm -hmm. and making your dreams come true okay so let's take a listen and everyone tune in and shout out to all the lambs who are with us right now here we go into make it happen I began as a waitress, but as management soon discovered, I was still a teen and couldn't legally serve drinks, so I was moved to the cash register. Boy, was that a disaster. I was a hard worker, but I had spent most of my working time in a recording studio, and working a register isn't like recording background vocals. I wasn't picking it up fast. And this was a neighborhood joint with regulars and no-nonsense waitresses, like Kiss My Grits, Flo, and Alice, but New York tough. Those broads hated me for messing up their money. Eventually, I got moved to the co check. Simple. But while I was hustling, I was also getting hustled. I wasn't allowed to keep my tips, which is pretty much the entire allure of being a co check girl. I got a dollar for every coat. I knew it wasn't fair, but I also knew it was temporary. None more than three short years ago I was abandoned and alone Without a penny to my name So very young and so afraid No proper shoes upon my feet Sometimes I couldn't even eat I often cried myself to sleep But I had to keep on going Make it happen <laughs> What I love about, you know, when I'm reading and listening, feel
Okay, so Miss Mariah Carey, here we are. Okay, so we just listened to an excerpt, Make It Happen, from your audio book. Please download it right here on Audible. So you know what I love about this time period in your life? It's the grind. It's the hustle. You're making your dreams come true. You move to New York City. The living situation is a whole (laughs) (laughs) What was that like for you? You know, what stands out to you when it comes to your living situation, trying to make your dreams come true as a professional singer? Well, I mean, I think about really like I remember at one point I live with a friend. We, we talk about all different places where I live with different people yes. during that time. Um, it was like a, a matter of like a year and a half. But at that point in your life, when you're just like starting out, it feels like forever. Um, I had really some roommate situations that I didn't even get into that much of it. I noticed that and it left me wanting more, maybe book two audible. Hello everyone. But I was, you, okay. Anyways, go on. No, so there, yeah, there were a lot of things. And then some people thought I was trying to allude to saying like certain people were really bad. No, there were people that I didn't even dredge up the discussion because at that point you have to go into a whole explanation of that person and why it was so screwed up or whatever. But I will say that, you know, I did live on, on a mattress on the floor. Um, I also lived above a little, um, it was like a, what do you call it when it's, they want to say again. It was a restaurant, then a club. Oh yeah, no, that, that part. I lived above, a, I lived above a, a, a restaurant club, but also I'm trying to, I'm trying to say that where I actually lived in the apartment, you had to jump onto the kitchen counter to get into the little quote unquote loft, as they called it. Um, but it really wasn't a loft, but then it was like $500 a month. And that was so much money for me at that point. And I just was so thankful. Um, for the people that were supportive, like my friend Clarissa, yes. who, um, you know, we talk about my alternative album <laughs> in the book as well. And she ended up working with me on on a version of that. That's a whole nother moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother moment. And by the way, it saves my life every day still. Yes. But, um, <laughs> but, but no, she was always cool because it was her place, but she was always like she also sang and she was also very supportive of of me and you know that i was a a young kid in the city and and just like pretty much on my definitely out there on my own which for the lambs who know that we have the rarities out yes um i had done um a version of out here on my own uh like around the glitter time when we never used it and um now ironically it's uh found and um, and it go it coincides with the story in the book where I talk about winning my first first trophy at twelve um, in a, a talent contest, and I sang that song. And we kind of talk about Irene Cara, who I loved growing up, and just always admired her and her songwriting. And she's just so beautiful. And she's you know biracial, and just her. I just related to her right. on many levels. And, and you know. It- in this, we get to hear about you really having to decide between either having breakfast or using that money for transportation. I mean, you were, you know, on, again, on the come up, trying to make your dreams come true. You only had one pair of shoes, mm-hmm. handed up to your mom, and they were a size and a half small. <laughs> did, did you ever get corn bunions? Like, what? You're out. You know, thank God I didn't, but it was really hard because, yeah, they were small, but you know, like leather shoes when they're kind of like stretchy. I don't know. It's like they're very, uh, they were hideous, by the way. <laughs> I wanted to have them made into, at one point, I, I had saved them for a really long time. So I was like, I know at some point, I, like I had that much faith and I had that much belief that I was like, at some point, I'm going to have a lot of shoes, but right now this is all we have. And right. they were like, so the foot was like here and there was like a flap like open. So if you, if I was walking to work and it was snowy out or whatever, the water would get into the bottom of the shoe and seep through and the whole flap was hanging. It was really disgusting. <laughs> But you made it. And you know what? Now it gives us a different appreciation when we do see your shoe closet. Yes. That was why. That that is why. It all makes sense, by the way. (laughs) Right? Really. And even songwriting, like also part of Make It Happen, we see your love for background singing and how much that means to you. And Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that part because 
you love music, whether you had all of this fame and success or not, you just love it. Yes. No matter what, I would always be making music or writing uh, and writing yes. and singing. Like people used to so try to discourage me. I remember when I was growing up and in school with regular kids mm -hmm. and regu who had regular parents and everybody tried to discourage me mm -hmm. from reaching for my dreams and that was such a you, you bring up the make it happen chapter and, and that song is something that a, a lot of pe people that I'm really cl close to have told me really affected them, like like Lee Daniels um, or Tyler Perry, different people who really did go through stuff and achieve stuff. Um, that song's always always been that to me. It's been it was very much um, an autobiographical song lyrically for me so yeah. when i think about those times i'm like yeah you just can't you just can't let yeah. other people discourage you right you just can't get involved yeah and be, being able to tell this story and narrate the story um doing this audio book has really brought me yeah well, listen, Mariah, we are... Closer to those moments in my life where you, you don't ever know when you're going through it. You don't know, but you have to believe that you'll make it. Yeah. Well, which is very important. I still have questions about Make It Happen, but really quick, we're going to go into the next clip. And this one is very interesting. Um I know for me, Mariah, it was heartbreaking for me to listen to this. Um, this next clip that we're about to go into, it is really about the time when, unfortunately, your mother called the cops on you, okay? So let's take a listen to Calamity and Dog Hair. We'll be right back. Betrayed, humiliated, and overwhelmed by reliving the neglect and trauma of my childhood, I let go. Not that I had any fight left in me, but I knew better than to fight with the police. I was done. Ironically, I was relieved that the police could take me away from this house of trauma and betrayal. My brother had lured me back into the same depths of dysfunction that he, my sister, and my mother had dwelled in when I was a child. My mother had stolen me from my sleep, then turned me over to the authorities. There was nothing left to do but surrender. I agreed to be removed from my own house by the police with one simple request, that I be allowed to put on my shoes. My family might have taken my pride, my trust, and the last of my energy, but they weren't going to get my dignity too. I slipped on some heels, meals most likely, neatened my ponytail, slapped on some lip gloss, and got in the back seat of the squad car. Being hauled off by cops was certainly no comfort, but I was defeated and needed to get away by any means necessary. The firm seat cushions and the bulletproof protection inside the car provided a twisted sense of security. My body was reminded that it was still in critical need of rest. Morgan slid into the back seat next to me. Okay, more with the Mariah Carey in a few minutes. Just going to make sure on her end the connection is going well so that all the lambs can enjoy this amazing conversation about her memoir, The Meaning of Mariah Carey. And thanks to Audible, we are here. We're able to listen to the audiobook, which, by the way, is amazing. I know for me, the experience has just been incredible. I encourage you, especially the holidays are coming up, perfect way to give someone a gift. Um, to the Lamely, all the lambs. This is such an incredible memoir. And just for anybody and everybody, definitely download the audiobook. It gives you a different experience. You actually get to feel Mariah. You get to hear what she was going through at very difficult moments and at incredible moments. I mean, you get to see this journey filled with ups and downs. And as we all know, 
she always makes it through. So definitely download the audiobook right here, thanks to Audible. And give us a few minutes. We still have so much to talk about. You know, we still have to talk about Calamity and Dog Hair, a um, couple other pieces that we must talk about, especially for the lamb. So we finally get some clarity in her audiobook. And and as always, we have to make sure that the lambs get their questions in. So make sure you are hitting up Mariah Carey on all her socials at Mariah Carey so that we can make sure we answer your questions. We'll do our best to get to them as always, for sure. We'll try. And that's going to be happening later on in the show. In the meantime, hang tight, call some friends, family, and tell them to be watching us right now on Audible Live as we talk to Mariah Carey. Hang tight.
MC Hank, with us talking about her incredible memoir. Please download the audiobook, The Meaning of Mariah Carey. Now, we just played an excerpt a little while ago, Mariah. It was Calamity and Dog Hair. And, you know, hearing you talk about being betrayed and humiliated by your family. And, you know, this was hard for me. I'm not going to lie to you. Listening to you go through this um, emotional situation where it resulted in your mother calling the cops on you and uh, because of a disagreement and really because as you explain in the memoir you were standing up for yourself Mm -hmm. you were tired and we're going to go back a little bit and how you even ended up in that situation but for the most part how does it how do you look at this calamity and dog hair and this experience well first of all i have to just say that all seriousness aside the title is my favorite <laughs> because it's dog hair. It's calamity and dog hair. Right. Like, and this is how I get through stuff, though. It has to go to some humor. Right. You know, we have to get through the bleakness. Yes. And and, and so that was, yes, it was a horrible experience that I will never forget. And I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Um, and yes, most people in this industry haven't gone through that type of a thing because what I, what I've, I mean, look, when they, when there's a family that's super dysfunctional from the start, you kind of coming at it, like, look, I got to make this career happen. I have to work. I have to work so hard so that I never end up like certain people that I looked at growing up and I didn't think they had it together. Um, and they didn't, you know, utilize their talents or the things that I felt like, wow, why wouldn't they at least try harder? So I mm-hmm. always worked like everybody's always told me you're the hardest working person I know. But, you know, at a certain point, I had to learn like it's OK post calamity and dog hair, post all of the humiliation right. and all of the stuff that, you know, goes into uh, it's it's really three chapters and calamity and dog hair is is in there so to hear it yeah as you said to hear it from the beginning is kind of very important because it's really like three chapters that kind of get get into all these details and stuff but what i really feel is that you know going through the the moments that i've been through that were that were so difficult um i don't know if they would have if I could have made it through if I hadn't had to be a survivor from such an early age. Wow. And we talk about that in the book, like from six years old, having to be that sort of um, like come and save the day type mm-hmm. of a thing. No pun intended. But that's what it that's what it really had to be for me back then. And it's always been that there's always like another mountain to climb. And I don't know why I'm uh, selected to be this mountain climber, but... <laughs> Mm. It is what it is. But really, you know, that was a very, very difficult period of time. And I think, you know, a lot of people who the book has resonated with, um, you know, some of the people that I've known that I'm that I'm inspired by um, that have been in this industry and that have succeeded have gone through stuff with the press. Mm -hmm. And and that was a very specific time um, with the press, because now it's like, you could just tweet something, tweet a response, you know, someone comes after you, you can deal with it, you know. Um, but back then, it's like when the press was ravenous for you, that's it. You're through. And, there, and you don't have like the next day scandal. Like now it's like, OK, well, what, what else is going on? Who else is right. what else is happening? But then it's like, OK, you get one scandal <laughs> a month. And that's where I was caught up. And and honestly, I have to say that this business is so hard because people want to control the artists yes that's what i have a problem with and that's what i can i've continued to try and grab a hold of and stop even in my own life because you let people in and then they think that they own you and it's really really hard and and you know what what, i want to jump back to make it happen speaking of Mm -hmm. we'll continue with calamity and dog hair but i want to talk about the artist and your 
experience and you know even throughout your memoir we hear you and people have helped you and you talk about prince and mm -hmm. you know, who was always defending the artist as we've just seen you know the historically where he stood and it, it it's so important that we really understand from you why why do you think that is is it because artists just love music so much for you and they know that you'll always want to do music mm -hmm. so the business side of it takes advantage of it it feels like this relationship that you know can go sideways at times yeah and that's an interesting way to describe it it is a relationship like i have a love affair with music with making music with being in the studio with writing right. you know what i mean and i and that's like you know prince is a whole nother level and, and i do talk about him in the book and how he really um encouraged me he was all about like emancipating the artists mm. and you know this business being so screwed up particularly back then i mean i think it's still pretty bad uh, <laughs> i'm not trying to be debbie downer about it but it's it's we're not there yet we need right. to evolve to another place with it but um yeah he he definitely there there's a special part in the book um where i try to pay homage and just appreciation um show appreciation for what he did for me as a person you know what right. i mean yeah, for sure, which is, mm -hmm. I can't emphasize enough. Please download the audio book. Please, please. It's just, it's so detailed. And also, you know, speaking of artists, one of the things that I love, Mariah, that you do in your memoir is show your admiration and your love to other legends and icons and people who have inspired you along the way, you know? And, mm -hmm. um, it takes me back to your love for being a, an artist, a songwriter, and then in Make It Happen, we see how that can be used against you. Also, your loyalty to anybody that really is believing it in you at this moment, right? So mm -hmm. we're hearing about you working on your demo, right? It's supposed to be an exciting time. You're working with a producer by the name of Ben, and you know, and and in the audio book, you really explain like you understood he wanted security he wanted paperwork with you because right. he's been working with you for a while but the paperwork that you ended up signing was you know a photocopy out of a book all you need to know about the music business and it really hearing the breakdown which we don't have to go in detail because i really want people to hear it and just hearing the percentages and everything that was taken from you mariah why didn't you want to readjust that contract I mean, I feel like you're better than me in that way. I don't know. I, <laughs> well, I did. I did want to. But I have to say, when I first signed it, and this is no disrespect to anybody and their hustle or whatever, sure. but, but, you know, when I first signed it, I was just trying to move forward. Like, I was just all about, let's literally make it happen. Like, right. you know, I'm not trying to um, sit around and wait. You know, and, and that was just this, that was my ambition. And I've always been that ambitious and that, um, you know, wanting to move forward. But I did want to, I did want to change the details of that contract, but I didn't want to do it if it was at going to harm somebody else. And wow. from my perspective at that point, I didn't understand, oh, well, you're going to sell X amount of millions of records. And this means such and such amount of money to somebody else. Like I didn't understand. And it was, and it was so early on for me um, in life in general that I was just like, you know what, I'm, I'm loyal. I'm going to remain loyal. And then I, you know, whatever it, it things happen and somebody should have looked at a deal that I signed, but I had no lawyers or whatever at that time. So yeah, it is what it is. It's all a learning experience. Yeah, for sure. Now I, I want to go back to the time period that we were talking about, you know, when we are talking about what we heard, the excerpt calamity and dog hair. And, you know, we kind of jumped right into it, that this was a very stressful, vulnerable time for you. And you really did count on your family to come through and help you and you were looking for them to nurture you and mm -hmm. let's reset a little bit because there's so much more to that and i think context is very important especially for the lambs out there to understand because we know that you've had an, an up and down relationship with your family let's paint the picture 
why did you end up going to the house that you purchased? Mm-hmm. And obviously um, your mom was living there. You know, that's just what family does. You look out for one another. Why did you go there initially? Well, on that day um, that we're talking about, I was really trying to just get some sleep after like, and I, you know, I think it's best to read about it rather than me go into it because it doesn't necessarily make sense because that moment didn't make sense. But I was trying to get a break. And as we talked about with the corporations and the people that end up um, looking at you as a, a paycheck, um, they don't care if you're tired. They don't care if you're dealing with um, other forces that are not, um, and again, this is going to, this out of context, as we said, but like dealing with people that I was dealing with at that time who weren't rooting for me to succeed. Right. Um, and so I needed to take just a day. And I thought, you know, these management people, whoever they are, keep trying to come around me. And I'm like, I just need a moment, like, give me a beat. You know, I'm right. at a new label. This is an unprecedented deal. It had, there had never been a deal this size. Um, in the industry, as far as I know. Um, right. And, you know, people were aware of that. People who were, quote unquote, close to me were aware of that. And they, people take advantage. They they get, there's, um, I don't even know how to express it fully at this moment, but there's, it's not just a jealousy. It's like, there's a feeding frenzy. Right. Where they're like, she's getting this. Well, we should be in charge of that. You know right. what I mean? And it's it's really unfair. And But this is what happened. So on that day, you know, it was like somebody sure. suggested, as I, I tell a story in the book, but suggested, oh, why don't we go up and have a nice trip to Pat's house? And I'm like, hmm, maybe they'll actually leave me alone if I go to my mother's house, which I bought, obviously. Right. Um, but if I go there, they'll be like, oh, she's at her, like, there's there. I always thought there was like this unspoken rule of, well, when you go to your mother's house, no one's going to bother you. No one's right. going to come up and try and make you do something or make you go to work when you need a break. And you went to those extremes to get away from everybody. Right. But that's just the way it happened. So calamity and dog hair. Yeah. And th- it, there's so much more to it. I mean, it was a very stressful time for you. And I just wanted to share that context because you really just wanted some sleep. You were on the road working nonstop, you know, glitter was happening, lover boy, the single, and you're, it was a lot that was going on. And obviously you were just trying to get some rest and mm-hmm. you know, looking into places to get some nurture. And that is why reading up and really listening to this audiobook and hearing you read back and narrate and really opening our eyes to everything, right? Like, I mean, mm-hmm. it covers everything from TRL and your music being stolen. Mm-hmm. And that was all in the same time. All in the same time, like within the the two months. Yeah. All right. You know, and it was intense. And you talk about Loverboy and then it's like, I'm sure there were lambs around the world who were like yay the song is selling so great and yes you know and it's number two meanwhile it was like a disaster oh my gosh it's only number two right and it, it i mean can you imagine <laughs> <laughs> and it's a soundtrack not even a studio album yeah exactly and then what i had gone through with that single and having to redo it and yeah. all the stuff that everybody um at this point if they care to know they they can read about it but you know it was it was tough and Look, it's not it wasn't it wasn't the end of the world. It's still not the end of the world. But at that point, it felt like the end of the world to me, my life, my situation. And I even remember like sitting back and watching. I don't know. It was a music channel or whatever. And they're like and I talk about this in the book. They're like speaking about me as if I had was already dead. Mm -hmm. And it was really tough. And that's why when you spoke about Prince and when he reached out to me and gave me you know, we had our moment, right? That was a saving grace. There's sometimes, you know, God gives us angels and we're lucky to have them. For sure. I know we're getting close to wrapping up, but we did promise the lambs that we would touch quickly on the father and the sunset. Okay. Quickly, Mariah, what would you say is the sentiment from this um, portion of your life that you shared with all of us? Well, I think, you know, in the beginning of my career, it was always like, oh, she's 
what was the word, estranged. She's estranged from her father. She's this and that. We really talked through so much. And I've talked about that in my songs. Not that, you know, everyone is dissecting the lyrics to Sunflowers for Alfred Roy or Bye Bye or, you know, any of these songs. But I, I have talked about it. And I was very thankful for those moments with him to be able to work through yeah. um, anything that we needed to talk about um, for us both. And the chapter is very rich in many ways, you know, very deep emotionally. But um I, I also feel like because it's the only chapter that really has kind of like a full song, if you will, because I wasn't setting out like, here, we're going to make songs. Like, it wasn't that. I just decided, let me put this together and worked on it with um, my musical director, Daniel Moore, and we just did it last minute. And um, so I feel like a after I did that chapter, recorded that chapter, I really felt like, okay, this is a new moment for me artistically like just making this i have to say and i'm not saying this for any other reason than for the truth of the matter this is a completely for me almost feels like a new genre of of creating wow. like because there is music i do sing there are lyrics there's obviously the 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 meat in terms of the the book itself but um for me this is just like a whole new place creatively and i'm looking forward to continuing um on this path yeah and i also love the sentiment of you and your father becoming close before he transitions and yeah. uh, you shared the importance of sunflowers you you shared you know uh reminiscing with him over his the, his, the meals that you both would have on sundays which is the white the linguine and white clam sauce which <laughs> Listen, it sounds so delicious. You should it's think the, it was the best. I'm so thankful he left me that recipe. I make it every year at um at on Christmas, um Christmas Eve, and uh, yeah, yeah. We need a cookbook, Mariah. I mean, think about it. <laughs> I'm you ready. Know. I'm so ready. I was talking about that today, or I was thinking yeah. about that today. <laughs> okay, so now we do have fan questions, and we wanted to go through this. I know you're so busy right now. I'm going to try my best to get through this very fast. And by the way, we could talk for hours about your incredible memoir. Just as a reminder, download it, the audiobook. Um, all right, so let's proceed with some fan questions. This is from at okay. JC25B. Looking In is a song that saved my life and kept me going in my most challenging times. At what point in your life did you write it from and how did you get Tommy to approve it going on Daydream? Wow, that sounds like someone that's very informed to know that I would have to approve it yes. um, or get it approved. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. First of all, Looking In is one of my most personal songs, one of my favorite songs that I've, that I've written. Um, it, was, I, I, it was the middle of the night I wrote it. Um, I got out of bed. It was in uh, the melody came to me and I went into my room where I lived at Sing Sing, um, mm -hmm. as I call it. They'll know why they read the book. Yes. And um, I wrote it in like 15 minutes and then ended up singing wow. the melody, um, what I wanted to do to Walter A, who I was working with at that time. And um, really, it wasn't easy to get somebody to approve it because it was real because I was saying, you know, she dreams of all that she can never be. She wades in insecurity and hides herself inside of me. But that she dreams of all that she can never be was taken as a personal affront by somebody. Mm -hmm. And it was just me being real. It wasn't me creating something. It wasn't me, it wasn't me creating something, but it wasn't me coming up with a storyline and here's what it is. It was just stream of consciousness. So I'm glad that it, the song has, the main thing is for it to help other people. You know yeah. what I mean? So it was my, you know, letting go of that and looking in and hopefully someone else, you know, I, I thank you for the question um, because it's, uh, it means a lot to me, that song. So hopefully it, it helped you as well. What this next question is from Just Like Honey. What part in the memoir was the hardest to write and why? Love you, Queen. Um, um, I, uh, each part was difficult in its own way because you're dredging up feelings um, and kind of going there sensorily. You're like going back to these moments and really reliving them. So, you know, I think a lot of the chapters we dealt with today were 
they're they're all different. Make it happen wasn't like a difficult moment, but it's an interesting moment. You know, um, calamity and dog hair was obviously very difficult to right. to write. Um, we talked about the father and the sunset. There there is so much more. A lot of the little girl stuff, a lot of stuff that happened to me as a little girl has really shaped who I was, and that's why I actually wanted the back cover of this book to be. Um, the front cover because mm-hmm. I wanted it to be her story, the little Mariah story, mm-hmm. you know, because that I've, as a grown up, I've gotten to get to this place where I, whatever, I'm not a grown up, none of us are grown ups, but, um, <laughs> you know, gotten to this place where it's like, okay, like I've succeeded, we've done this, we've had accomplishments, yay. But my little girl self really felt lonely and scared mm-hmm. and alone a lot of the time. So this is like me being on, on, uh, team Lil Mariah. <laughs> yeah, as you should be, always. <laughs> the next question is, can you tell us a little about the making of I Am Free, like the inspiration behind the song, how you wrote the lyrics, what it means and represents to you, Love You Mimi, and that is from Angel Down at Joe DeFacelli. Okay. Um, wow, I Am Free. So it's interesting. One of my favorite songs that I've done as well I haven't listened to it in a while, I must say, but it, when I think about the fact that I wrote I Am Free and recorded it at Sing Sing, um, technically I wasn't free, <laughs> but what it was about was a spiritual free- freedom that I felt. Um, that's what that song is. It's like my saving grace in mm. that way because it's holding on to faith and to God no matter what you're going through. Mm. And that was um that's where i was coming from in that place but one of my favorite things with that song was recording the background vocals by myself and really have like i I love to do that that's one of my favorite things and um i you know texturing it so that it felt more like i was with a group of people but it was it was me (laughs) (laughs) Uh, this question who's your guardian angel from close my eyes i must have played that song a million times and that's just counting the 2020 version and a million times it has moved me to tears because of the pure beauty in that moment that question is from luis alvira thank you for the question luis um but i can't answer it unfortunately because i need to leave that up to everybody to have their guardian angel be their guardian angel and mine be mine i love that well listen mariah carey mimi mc we appreciate you so much and taking this time to talk to all of us and of course you do this for the lambs you do it for your fans and i love that you really share this in your memoir the importance of that connection that love that they gave you Mm -hmm. Uh, we thank you so much for always giving it back to us and listen mariah we could talk a lot more but a lot of the things we would talk about is right here in your audiobook i encourage everybody to experience it download it thank you to audible yes of mariah carey please yeah. available now download it and mariah any final last words about your memoir and you know it for your lambs well, first of all, um, thank you for detail, like re- reminding me that that is very well detailed. I think only on a small level, I could never really express how the lambs changed my life and made me feel um, like a part of of a family, mm-hmm. and that was something that I never had. So, don't want to get too emotional with it, but it's it's really true. And, um, you know, everybody, I'm sure everybody has their own special relationship with their fans and that's great. And we love that, but I feel like there's a different connection and there, and there was before social media and there still is. And I don't know if I, if I say it enough, but for everybody who's been so supportive with this new chapter in my life, no pun intended with chapter, Mm -hmm. but really, um, just so much unconditional love and appreciation from me to you and i love you love you love you and nessa couldn't have done this with anybody but you um i love you i I love love you so much much. i didn't even tell you how fabulous your hair looks today by the way you're featuring the swoop and i love the swoop thank you thank you (laughs) thank you so much but you know mariah we love you we are already in the holiday spirit of course loves you he says hi He's watching in the other room. As always, we love you, Mariah, and we're always here for you, and we're always proud of you. 
And I'm always proud of you both. And I love you guys. Thank you so much. And um, talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Love you. Bye. Bye, Bye, everyone.